We met in 1971 over the radio, and our friendship continues through today. I think of her as my best friend and one of the smartest, most generous, and inspirational people I have ever known. Yoko, along with John, helped inspire a generation of people who believed in the power of imagining a world of peace and love. I began representing the John Lennon estate in 1980 and have worked alongside Yoko for more than half my life. In spite of all that she has been through, she remains optimistic, hopeful, sharing, and committed to the fundamental ideas of the John and Yoko experience. I could not imagine my life without her. We spoke on many occasions on the radio, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes with John. There are samples of these conversations available for you to listen to in various locations in the jukebox. This interview is a sample of our very first conversation over the phone, on the air, in 1971. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for letting us visit with you. This is going to be a joy for everybody. My pleasure. Um, Yoko, I want you to give us an idea of the four or five influences in your life that have yes. cr contributed to where your head is at right now. Just a general idea of what's led up to the present Yoko Ono consciousness. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty difficult question. Of course, you know, it's no doubt that John had a lot of influence. I mean, John has a lot of influence in my life. But uh, before that, of course, Grateful was, well, you know, written before that, a long time before that, actually, 1964 or something. But uh, <clears throat> I think everything influenced me. You know, in my case, I can't name one person. I can say the wind, the sky, the waves, anything that came across my life influenced me. Do you and made me what I am now, you know. Do you think you've been more influenced by people or by concepts? Uh, a lot by concepts, but of course concepts, concepts are always connected with people. So uh, I'm not one of those who like to just read con conceptual stuff and forget about the author and his private life or her private life. I'm always interested in their, their private lives as well. Um, just anything interests me. It's amazing, It's you know, that... John and I both are this way, but we are interested in things that are tremendous, you know, like uh, it starts from uh, uh, very trivial things. I don't know what is trivial, but, you know, flowers, uh, just the kind of wind or air that, you know, we're always breathing, that interests us. Uh, the kind of water that uh, we soak our hands in or anything, you know, that interests us. People that we meet also are very interesting. Uh, you know, some people are more influenced by Karl Marx than mm -hmm. uh, somebody who uh, who is a telephone operator that you always talk, by the way, you know, while you're right. making a phone call or something. But in my case, I would say both of them influence me equally, you know, equally strong. One of the things, Yoko, that, that always comes across in your work is a, is a kind of timelessness. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Because you seem to deal in elements that are, that are that are very everlasting. You talk so much about snowflakes and wind and water and sunshine. Yes. And Those are the things that influence me the most. You see, for instance, before it snows, it's an incredible thing that uh, just like dogs, you know, dogs start to get happy or something. They start to uh, wag their tail more just before it snows or something. I understand. I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know, but you know, somebody told me about it. I don't know if it's. It, true or not even, you know, but then, so I said, well, then I'm like a dog then, you know, <laughs> just before it snows, I just sort of feel something, you know, and I start to get sort of elevated in a way, you know, and then I, then I see snow and I think, oh, that's what it was, you know, it's always like that. Yoko, you were educated at Sarah Lawrence School, weren't you? Yes, I was. Well, I don't know if you, you can call it an education. I was there, yes. 
you, you almost answered the question. The question is, do you think that formal education, sitting in classrooms and reading from books, etc., etc., tends to drive people away from the, the natural pursuit of, of the things that you talk about? Yes, I definitely think so. You know, in my case, it was sort of like a, a constant struggle and fight between uh, my natural uh, inkling for uh, liking nature, you know, and things like that, that really overwhelms my life. And uh, with that and the library, you know, mm -hmm. I had to really put myself to really go to the library. And so I was, at one point, I was really sort of drugged by books, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was always in the music library, always just reading or just listening to music. And library was like my cozy uh, little nest, you know. I see. There were times like that, too. Yoko, do you consider yourself a religious person? Uh, I don't know what religion is, really. I mean, if you consider Karl Marx is also a religion and all that. But I see them very objectively, you know. I can't really get into one religion, although I think it would be good if I could get into one religion and then probably I can make it. Make it means that I could really, if I had some faith, a really strong faith in something, then through that faith, I can relax my body, I can relax into something, you know? But I don't have those things, really. I just believe naturally in people. Basically, I think people are all beautiful, and uh, each, one, each one of them are like a vast universe, you know? So I believe in people. If you call me humanist or something, then that's what I am probably, you know? So in essence, you don't believe that there's any greater force other than man and woman? Men and women, flowers and, you know, trees, all the same, you know. But not anything like a divine being or a god or anything like that. Everything is divine, you know. I understand. Yes. Politically, politically, you and John uh, uh, have gone through so many transitions together. Where is your head at today, politically? Well, uh, it's just, you know, basic uh, human humanitarian kind of concept. It's very difficult. I know that the most difficult thing to do is to be what you are and not to join a party, you know? Right. Because it would be so much easier if we can say, well, uh, I believe in so-and-so party. Then it would simplify matters, you know? We can just sort of uh, set a rule to ourselves and just live as whatever the party tells us or whatever. But there's no party that we can think of in terms of well, they can be our father figure, whatever, you know? I see. Uh, so we won't... I mean, I can't say that I belong in any party or I trust in any party. Uh, we believe in our own bags, so to speak, you know? I understand. But we believe in our bags just as we have respect for other people's bags as well. What are the things in, in the world, Yoko, that disturb you the most, that upset you the most? The fact that people think that they have to be some way, you know, that they live in should must, not that they are, you know. They somehow feel that what they are is not enough or what they are is bad or uh, something shameful or they have to feel guilty that they are this way or that way and they feel that they should or they must be the other way, you know. The, the and uh, they sort of torture themselves to be what they are not. But... Uh, I wish they would start to become a bit more interested in what they are and feel more free to be what they are, you know? That's an extraordinarily uh, perceptive observation on your part, and I'd, l I'd like to explore it a little further. Why? Why are people in that bag? Why aren't people able to, to deal with who they are and not constantly try to be something that they're not? Why do you... Because their parents were uh, sort of... Uh, you know, sadly, the parents were in the same bag, you know. They had their own parents who told them that they were no good. They have to be this way. They're not good as they are, etc. And they, they were tortured, you know. Mm -hmm. And they went through the same suffering. And therefore, they're giving to their own children saying, Well, look, you know, you can't be this way. You have to be this way. You must be. You should be this way, you know. And if somebody asked me what is my concept of utopia which I hope would come soon or whenever, you know, uh, is a place where everybody in the world would have their own freedom. 
That is my concept of utopia. In in your concept of utopia, uh, in your in your place b behind the gates of Eden, would there be any laws or rules? Uh, would there be any laws or laws rules? Laws or rules that they would really try to understand what they really want and live as they really want. You know, I mean, if you call that a rule, but I mean, they have to be honest to themselves. Each person. Some people said that uh, you know. Uh, uh, human beings, they, they're using only about 20% of their brains. Yes. And 80% of it has been prohibited somehow uh, by certain repression and pressure we got from outside. And we're, not, we're only using 20% of it actively. And the rest of the 80% is either sleep or, you know, not being used. And if you use the whole total 100% brain, we would be a wiser person, you know, we would be wiser people. And then if we are wiser people, we would never do anything that would harm us, you know. So we don't have to say, well, be careful, don't do this, because this would harm you. And I really believe in total freedom, and the world of total freedom would come when there's total communication in the world. Total communication equals peace. You know, when there's a total communication, that means there's total understanding and total acceptance between people. And that is when we have peace. Let's, uh, let's talk about... That sounds insane and crazy. It happens to be the most rational thing I've heard in the past six days. Oh, yeah. great. But you, you know what I mean, you see. Total communication is what we're seeking now. And I think uh, artists, you know, when I say artists, everybody's an artist. But our role and what we can do here in the, in the world and the society is to really promote communication. Everybody has the right of communication, and everybody should communicate and to speak out what they think. And the more we communicate, the better we would come to or reach an understanding. So we have a total communication, then we would have no violent thoughts, because violence is just an emotion that comes out in people when there's no communication. Yoko, the last time we spoke, you, you mentioned that too, that everyone is an artist. Yes. And I'd like you to explore that with us a little further, because so many people feel inhibited and feel that they are really... In, in other words, a lot of people say, well, it's John and Yoko who are the artists, and we're the audience, and we're going to sit back and allow them to turn us on. Oh, uh, that's silly. That's really silly. You see, uh, people are brought up there again, that's education, by uh, people saying, well, we, look, you don't have a talent in this. You have this kind of talent, but not this kind, that kind, you know. And the thing is, uh, it doesn't involve talent to become an artist. It only involves a certain frame of mind to become an artist. And anybody can have that a frame of mind. It just means to have a certain attitude and determination to express yourself, to communicate. And then art is just a necessity, you know. Uh, necessity would be bring them imagination and technique to N communicate, Nece and that's art. Necessity would bring them uh, imagination to communicate, and that's art. That's a yes. beautiful way of putting it. Yes, you know, necessity of communication, you know. Art is the necessity of communication. Yes, and if you are so desperate in communication, then you would eventually find a way of communication, and that is the art of communication. Yoko, let's talk about dope for a few moments, okay? Oh, all right. What is your position these days about drugs, any kind of drugs, all kinds of drugs? Well, I think that uh, drug-wise, even aspirin hurts your body, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's very sad that just about everybody in this world is, uh, you know, dependent on drugs, most of us, pills, you know? Mm -hmm. And even a housewife who doesn't take any kind of strong drugs, I'm sure they would take aspirin or sleeping pills or some kind of other, you know? Especially in the United States, you know, the pill is something. We're brought up in a pill culture, you know. Have you ever have you ever had any difficulties in terms of an involvement with drugs? Well, my life is not based on uh, taking drugs. Uh, that is not how I get high. Uh, I get high, for instance, when I wrote Grapefruit, I was first saying, uh, when Grapefruit was first published, I said, this is a book for toilet reading. 
and this is a book to get high without taking any drugs. So uh, I read some, uh, you know, things that I said before uh, I met John in London. Somebody brought me some papers that I wrote before, and it says something about uh, someday I'll see that the hippie culture or the psychedelic age would turn against me when they immediately see that uh, I'm not saying that acid is it, you know, that uh, I believe in uh, getting high just by, uh, you know, breathing or just feeling the wind or just breathing the sun or whatever. And I think that's obvious in the, the grapefruit. There, there is something in, in Grapefruit that you wrote in the spring of 64. I'd just like to read it. It takes yes. a minute, and then I'd like you to talk about it for a moment, okay? Yes. It's called Falling Peace, and it says, Go outside of you. Look at yourself walking down the street. Make yourself tumble on a stone and fall. Watch it. Watch other people looking. Observe carefully how you fall, how long it takes, and in what rhythm you fall. Observe as seeing a slow motion picture film. What did you mean by falling piece? <laughs> I'm so glad you, you know, you picked that piece. Because that's one of the sort of delicate pieces, I think, in the grapefruit, you know? Yes, it is. And uh, it's just based on an experience. I was in a Harvard summer school when I was in Sir Lawrence, and I was walking, and I just fell, you know? And I saw everybody watching it. And I thought, oh, this is very interesting. I experienced me going outside, looking at myself falling, and other people looking at it, etc. And that's when I wrote the piece. It wasn't really actually written in 1964, but since the book was published in 1964, and, um, you know, many of the instructions, I said, oh, that one, this one, I remember that one and all that. And I just, you know, those, I didn't remember the dates, so I just put 64, you know.